Okay. Praise the Lord, everybody. I am missing being in the house of the Lord today. But uh, evidently it can't be helped. Tonight we'll be reading a little bit out of Acts chapter 10. Uh, you'll notice that each evening I'm trying to do something different. And in fact, you can see me over Renee's shoulder there. But um, my, my mother, Sister Readout, and Steve Readout, and my father, they all had these nice presentations and the little, you know, bubble with their head in. And then you've got me bouncing around all over the place just talking because I can't do presentations and pictures. Next time I'm going to have a couple of uh, little drawings on them, and I'll just do this. And that way it'll look like I've prepared a presentation for you. But uh, I'm hoping you can hear me. Uh, I think I've got the, the sound system set up. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, we're trying a million different things until eventually, as soon as I figure this out, we're going to be back in church so I can worship in, with you in person. And I'm looking forward to that. But um, we're probably going to keep it short and sweet tonight. But let's start off. We'll turn to Acts chapter 10, and we'll read verses 1 through 20. Uh, so I'm going to move over there so you can still see me. In, uh, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band, it doesn't matter, called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto them, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which came unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Uh, again, I'm sorry, we're recording off of this screen, but I can't keep things together. So anyway, let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love and your mercy to us. We ask, Lord, that you move in our hearts and our minds to hear your word tonight, that we would feel your presence, that you would open up your word to us, that we might uh, eat the meat thereof, and that we could continue to grow in you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Let's all settle back and get comfortable. If you've got food, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be offended. So this next section on Cornelius is going to take up quite a bit of time. And I can't decide if I'm going to give a quick overview or if I'm just going to focus on the section of text I did. Uh, so we'll figure out as we go along. Um, but this section takes place in chapter 10. It, it tells the entire narrative of the conversion of Cornelius. It tells a tale of two visions and in, and in both cases, obedience to the vision and the calling. And then there was a, a response, much like we see uh, throughout the scripture, when people obey God, good things tend to happen. So this section, then we go into, whoops, into verse, uh, into chapter 11, where the whole story gets told again to the uh, Jews in Jerusalem. Uh, and when you, when you look at the combined amount of text given to this narrative, you'll find that uh, more text is dedicated to this narrative of the conversion of Cornelius and Peter's vision. Uh, then is given to the lame man at Gate Beautiful. Uh, the two men dying because, or the two people, Ananias and Sapphira, dying because they lied to God. Uh, the man healed after eight years of being bedridden with a palsy uh, and the raising of Dorcas from the dead. All those things combined took up less space than is dedicated to this narrative of the conversion of Cornelius. Uh, in fact, more text is dedicated to this conversion of Cornelius than is uh, given 
on the great revival that took place among the Samaritans. And you say, John, why are you wasting my time with this? I don't care about text size comparison. The reason we care about this is the scripture gives the detail for a reason. Every word of scripture is God breathed. It's inspired by God. God knows every word to use. God knows how to tell the story the way he wants it told. God has a purpose for every word. And so as I look through this, I have to uh, at least consider the idea that God gives appropriate priority to those things which are most important. All right, everybody just stare at the screen. Amen. If you, if you disagree, don't stare at the screen. So uh, anyway, ultimately, the reason that so much text is given, in my opinion, is because it shows just how important this conversion is. It's not just the story of one man. It's the story of you and me. It's the story of our hope of life everlasting. Without this original conversion of Cornelius, you and I would not be allowed into the kingdom of heaven. Salvation would not yet be given to us. But because of Cornelius and his searching after God in this response, we, you and I, are welcomed into this body of Christ. So if you think about it, uh, Christianity is an offshoot of the Judaic religion. It's not just an offshoot, it's the fulfillment of the Judaic religion. Uh, religion. The Old Testament speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Its purpose is to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ, to prophesy his coming, and then to, uh, and to allow us to know when he had fulfilled it. The Old Testament all points to Jesus Christ. So Christianity is not just an offshoot. It is the actual fulfillment. In fact, the Lord says, I come not to destroy, but to fulfill the law. And so when you start looking at the, at the uh, beginning of the chapter, or uh, the book of Acts, uh, it, well, before we even get there, the Lord himself, as he was going through ministering, he made it clear that his ministry was to the Jews. There was that Canaanite woman to whom he said, uh, is it meat to give bread, and you take bread from the children and give it to the dogs? Now, she knew enough about God to say, yeah, but even the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from the table. And she knew enough about God to realize that the greatest miracle that could occur in this world is just crumbs in, in the hand of, in the, uh, compared to the power of the Almighty God. She knew enough about the Lord to also know that he is great and full of mercy and loving tenderness and loving kindness. And so she, was, she responded correctly, and the Lord gave her her petition. God did not ignore her. But the point was that his purpose, his main goal was first to the Jews. In fact, Paul uh, writing said that it had to be first to the Jews. It couldn't have gone to the Gentiles until the Jews rejected uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And once they did, then it was open to be given unto the Gentiles. So all along, Christianity is the fulfillment of this old covenant between uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. In fact, when you look at all the times that Jesus refers to God, he refers to him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. Uh, he's, it's, I know I don't have to continue to prove this, but I'm going to for a little bit anyway. Uh, the fact is Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. Jewish, Jude, uh, Jude, the Judaic religion through and through. And so when in the beginning of Acts, the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit fell in the, in the day of Pentecost. It was among the Jews. And there were some Gentiles who had converted to Judaism, who were living according to the law of Moses. And they could have been, you know, they were part of that uh, second uh, outpouring when Peter uh, preached to the, the devout men. But, but it was primarily to the Jews. And there is even indication that the uh, Ethiopian eunuch was a, a, a proselyte of uh, of uh, Jew, uh, Judaism. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had the scroll of the prophets to read through and the chariot and wonder what it meant. So he, you know, also was uh, considered Jew, a Jew in the within the religious uh, mindset. And, uh, and so all along, uh, the the church, even during the uh, during the persecution, when they ran, you know, when they scattered abroad, they were preaching in the synagogues, where you read uh, Peter and John preaching in the synagogues, not where the Gentiles were. 
this was a Jewish centered, a Hebrew centered uh, mindset at this point. Uh, and then we go to this church in Samaria and the revival there and what a miracle it was that God was actually working amongst half Jews or who the Jewish people would have considered mongrels. And what an amazing miracle that would have been in their mindset. And yet, even as they, they continued on uh, throughout the area, Peter going ar around and ministering to all the churches, he was still doing so to all the Jews, to all the Hebrew people. It was not yet open for the Gentiles. So if you felt a little bit excluded, there's a reason for it. It was not yet poured out among the Gentiles. And so this is one of the reasons that Cornelius is so important to you and to me, except for those of you who are Jewish, I guess, um, that for those of us who are Gentiles, because this is the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the fulfillment of this prophecy of Joel, uh, poured out my spirit upon all flesh. This is where we see that fulfillment applied to us. The day of Pentecost, wonderful, still would have excluded us until it was poured out to the Gentiles as well. And this is why I believe Cornelius takes up so much space in, this, in the book of Acts. Uh, it is critical to us who are Gentiles because he is the first fruit, if you will, of the outpouring of the Spirit among the Gentiles. And so here we are. We start off it, with Cornelius, and it, it tells us that he is a that he's in Caesarea. Well, let, let's think about that for just a second and point out the fact that Philip was also in Caesarea. We, we read about that a little bit earlier. And yet Cornelius did not send for Philip. It didn't seem as though Philip and Cornelius were friends or had a relationship at all. But here is this man, a man living in Caesarea, a Roman officer, a centurion of the cohort known as the Italian band. Uh, a little bit of trivia for you is that Roman legions were uh, typically uh, consisted of 10 cohorts, uh, which also known as bands. And each of these cohorts, if, if I remember correctly, had six uh, centuries or groups of 100 soldiers within them. So the Italian band is roughly 600, 600 men. And Cornelius was a centurion over one of those centuries within the Italian band. And uh, the reason they were called Italian, the Italian band is probably because it was made up of people from Italy. So think about that. The first Gentile Christian was a Paisan. I think the hills appreciate that, right? Yeah. <laughs> The caches, you like that, right? Uh, Italians were the, were the first uh, converted to Christianity amongst the, the Gentiles, and so uh, we are told that he's a you know that he's of the Italian band. We're told that he was a devout man and one that feared God, not just that he feared God, but that he feared God and his whole household feared God. You see, you realize really quickly once you have a household even as we view it. Uh, back then, his household also consisted of servants and extended family. And, you know, it was, it was a bigger concept than what we currently have. But if you've had children and you've tried to raise them in the truth, you understand that fearing God is not just enough. Uh, you can fear God, but it only lasts one generation. And it takes a whole lot more effort to walk that walk and instill that fear of God into your children so that they can grow up also in the fear and the knowledge of God, that they also can make their own choices but choose to serve him. So we see that Cornelius was doing his duty. There's a reason that I didn't have a choice about whether or not I was going to church on Wednesdays and Sunday morning and Sunday night and Friday night and on Saturdays when there was a rally and on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, when we had special services. And, you know, there's a reason I didn't have a choice when I was growing up. And yes, my dad probably would have preferred to leave me at home a few times so he didn't have to listen to the grumbling. But the reason I ha that he drug us around was because you have to instill that fear of God, not, not afraid of God, 
but that awe and that reverence towards God. You have to understand that he must be the center of your life or you're living a life that's not worth living. And so we see that Cornelius had done his diligence in mandating the worship across not just him, not just those who are willing, but the servants. You are also going to fear God. You are also going to live as I uh, understand serving God. And so uh, he did that diligence and that his whole household feared God. And we'll, you know, in a little while, we'll read more about another household who converts to Christianity. But it's always a sign of, of the depth of the devotion that one doesn't just say, well, it's good enough for me, but I'm not going to impose it upon my children. But recognizing the criticality of having a relationship with God, of, of being right before God. Uh, of serving God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Uh, without that being your understanding, you have to impart that upon other people and, and to train up those who you have responsibility for. If, if you do not insert, or if you do not instill and teach them that God deserves all your heart, all your energy, all your emotion, all your mentality, if, if, they, if you are not teaching your children that they must serve God before all other things, then you are not fulfilling your job as a parent. Those who are depending on you for proper upbringing are not uh, being appropriately brought up. So he's a devout man and he feared God with his household. And we are also told that he gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. It's kind of amusing to think of a centurion uh, walking through the military and drills. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Kill that guy in Jesus. Name. You know, it, it seems like uh, our understanding of praying always would not fit in with some of the battles he might have had to fight in or in some of the drills he had to do. Praise the Lord in your mercy, Lord, give me another 100 push-ups. Yeah, I kind of like that one, actually. But uh, it, it, under, it, it alters our understanding of what it means to always pray, right? Pray without ceasing. Obviously, prayer is not just what we say out loud before the Lord or even what we say in our minds before the Lord. It's that continual standing before the Lord, that relationship that we have that allows constant communication. Uh, I can be in a room with my wife and we don't have to talk all the time. We're still communicating. Um, just a look sometimes is a communication. Sometimes it's just the body language and, and we can communicate that way. It's not always the, you know, she would get so upset with me if I was like, oh, Renee, 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 Renee. Hey, Renee, you're gorgeous. Hey, Renee, my beautiful wife. Renee, you're so pretty. What would you like to eat today? Oh, Renee, I asked Renee, if you would please, Renee, go get me a, a drink, Renee, because Renee, you know, I'm busy, Renee. She, you know, you're already irritated. Some of you are going to get food. You know, God is, is not different in that regard. And so we need to remember when we pray, it's a conversation. You listen, you observe, you have that communication coming in as well as going out. It's not enough to stand there and make demands. If all I did was make demands, I don't think all I do is make demands. Uh, we're going to pretend that all I do is not to make demands, but I do also good things as well. But it, it's a, it would not result in a good relationship if all you do is make demands and you are not open to hearing the word of the other party. So when we read this as he prayed always, we have to understand it's not just that he attended the prayer services when they were there. He, you know, uh, he didn't just go to the three o'clock prayer meeting and the 10 o'clock prayer meeting, but that his entire life was spent in that communion with God. And he's a devout man. Uh, when it's when that term devout men, when it's applied to Gentiles, it doesn't mean he's a Jew, that he had fully converted. It does mean that he is one of the, the people included in the phrase, all those who fear the Lord, uh, that he has acknowledged the God of Israel as the one true God. Uh, it means that he would have worshipped in the synagogue, but he would not have been allowed into, uh, into certain areas. He would have been able to worship at the gate. Uh, he would, uh, the indication is that he had not been circumcised. He was not following all the ceremonies uh, of, and the laws of Moses, but he did worship and acknowledge the uh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob as the one true God. And uh, that was enough for him to be known as devout. 
And the scripture says that he was devout. That doesn't mean he's saved. It means he loves God according to his knowledge of God. It means he is it's submitted to the God of his understanding and that he was uh, doing his best as he knew best. Now we are told in the scripture that if we draw nigh unto God, he will draw nigh unto us. And we are also taught that, uh, if, that if we search for him with all our hearts, he will be found of us. And so we see in the same instance, we see the proof, Cornelius not being saved, but having a love for God. You remember the video that we showed? Well, most of you, you won't, uh, but one of the Shoes for Christ or uh, whatever the offering one, there's a guy who was up in Alaska. It was one of my favorite ones, so we played it like four times. But he said the Lord told him about a, a, a group of people and said they love me, but they don't fully know me. It's possible to know God in part and love him to the extent of your knowledge and the extent of your ability. If you do that, God will make sure that you have an opportunity to learn more about him. God will not allow those who love him to be lost out of ignorance. He will make sure that you have the choice to serve him or not. Whether or not you will be uh, satisfied with serving him where you are right now, or if you will want to, uh, or if you will uh, submit yourself and move further into that relationship with God and to the fullness of truth. God will not leave you stranded. He will make sure you have a chance at salvation if you love him and seek after him. That's the, that's the answer to the argument. What about the poor guy in deepest, darkest third world country who's never heard of Jesus? How could he possibly, you know, will God condemn him unjustly to hell? The answer is no. God is not unjust. God will provide him an opportunity to serve him, to come to the full revelation of who he is. And it's up to that person to move forward with that knowledge and that understanding or to stay where he is and reap the rewards of either action. So Cornelius was a devout man and he gave alms. I love this section about giving alms because devout man is, is so easy to read and think, well, I'm devout because I go to church on Sunday. I haven't missed an Easter in the last, <laughs> we can't say that anymore. Uh, I've watched an Easter service every year for the last, you know, so I'm devout. You know, I, I even go to church on Super Bowl Sundays. How much more devout can a man be? You know, it, it's, it's easy to, to think of devout and assume you are devout. But what, uh, what the scripture then comes on to tell us is that he was a, a devout man. He feared God with all his house. He had that proper concept of God and God's place in his life. God was not a person to, a, a being to manipulate into doing what he wanted. See, even you and me, we have that tendency uh, to let fear or reverence uh, lapse into manipulation. Hey, God, you can do anything and you love me, right? Well, then how about you do this for me? Oh, God, why don't you do that for me? Hey, God, if you're so omnipotent, how about you do that? You know, I, I made a joke a while ago. He could turn water into wine. Why can't he turn oatmeal into brownies? You know, uh, the, the fact is we spend our, that, that deserved an amen from somebody. But uh, the, the fact is we are so used to using God's omniscience as a means to try, or as a mindset to manipulate him into altering our circumstances as we would see fit. But when it says that he's a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, it lets us know that he was not into trying to manipulate God, but that God had that proper place as the Lord in his life, that he was, in sub, he was subservient, he was in submission to God, that he loved him and served him with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. We need to be careful in our own mindsets that we do not lose sight of who God is. It's so easy to say, oh, he's a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. And, and I'm not saying anything bad about uh, having a friend in Jesus. I'm so glad that he is also my friend. But before he's my friend, in priority before he's my friend, he is my Lord and my God. He's my God first. And then he can 
be my friend because he has befriended me. Not because I'm great, but because he is great beyond imagining, because his loving kindness stretches beyond our comprehension. And so uh, it lets us know more and more about Cornelius. It's easy to pass over. This is one sentence. I thought this was going to be a five minute message. So maybe it'll be a 15 minute message. Uh, but it, it lets us know that Cornelius was what we would want to be in the extent of our knowledge of God, or in his, insofar as his knowledge of God. Uh, when, we say, when we hear people say, oh, I don't have to serve God, I'm just a good person, and God will honor that. Uh, yeah, God will honor that, but not the way you think. That's not a path to salvation. But if you do what God has said is important to God, he will make sure that you have an opportunity to learn more about him. He will make sure that he is not far from you and that he can still reach you and that you can still hear him. And so we find out that he gave, all, he gave much alms to the people. And one of the great things about this is, uh, be, like I was saying, is it's easy to think of devout and yet not actually change your mindset. But when you see this, you know, so much of our life as, as preachers, our lives are spent preaching, it's not enough to love God if you don't love your neighbor. It's not enough to love God and do nothing. You're not loving God if you don't love your neighbor. And so we see here that uh, Cornelius was, had his heart in the right place, but he also had his wallet and his manners in the right place. If you can't serve God with your wallet, you're not serving God with your heart. You're welcome. But he says uh, it's not just that he was devout, but that he gave much alms. We, we can look at in Matthew 23, 37. I'm going to read a couple. We know this. We've been through this a million times, but this is a tailor-made opportunity to revisit, right? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Not as kind of like it, or uh, it's in the same vein. It, it's like. It, it's This is... It's just like, in other words, this is similar. This is a mirror image of this. And that is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Loving thy neighbor as thyself is just, it's on par with loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You can't do the first without doing the latter. And he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And then again, we look in Mark 12, it's, it's a similar thing. One of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving, let, let's see if, oh, here's better. And perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The second is like, not like you and I use like, but it has the same, you've heard the term, the spirit and the letter of the law. That's what this is. The spirit of the first commandment is the same as the spirit of the second commandment. Love thy neighbor, and that's loving God. If you love God, you have to love your neighbor. I, I know I, I harp on this so long, and, and the scribe answered and agreed with them. And um, part of the thing that makes this so thrilling is because this is something that you and I can do. See a need, meet the need. Somebody needs something, be the one to fulfill that. Don't just love like I do from afar and send thoughts and prayers. Take action. Demonstrate that love, and you're loving the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, again, Matthew 25, 34 is when the king says to those on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, 
and you took me in naked and ye clothed me. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison and ye came unto me. Then sh that doesn't sound like something that a king would go through. How many kings are naked? Well, there was one emperor who was naked. Uh, no, that's just a you know that's a that's a parable of sorts. It's not actually, but uh, anyway, that, that's not a circumstance you would assume a king would be in. And so the righteous answer him. The ones who are righteous answered him and said, hey, wait a minute. Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or, or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? They're saying, hey, king, I think I would have remembered if I saw you naked and hungry. I don't remember that. But these are righteous people without ever realizing that they were doing this for their king. And the king said, and as much as ye have done it unto the least, one of these, the least, or one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Again, his brethren, if, if you love your neighbor as yourself, God takes that as you loving him. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Isn't that a great gift that we're giving? I remember one time I was driving along. I was, I was just coming back to the Lord. And, and I, you know, we, we always use these phrases which sound really good, but ultimately are kind of meaningless without more behind it. And, uh, I'd been in, in a service and, and the preacher's like, you have to submit. And I'm like, well, how do I submit? You got to submit. How do I do that? By submitting. Not as helpful as you might imagine. You know, and so I'm like, well, okay, God, you got to show me then because I don't know how to do that. Uh, I thought I did submit myself. And then it was, uh, he was explaining to, the Lord was explaining to me and through conversations with my pastor that submission is not a one and done deal. Submission is a lifestyle. It's every moment, every chance you have to do what you want versus what the Lord would want, and you do what He wants, you're submitting. And so it wasn't a, I was missing out on this one thing, so I was going to hell. It's, hey, you have to have this mindset of submission towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And another instance that I got sidetracked here, uh, and my, uh, my laptop's about to die, so this is going to be a really short service. Um, was I was I was driving along and I was saying, Lord, you know, I I I do my best. I I think I love you, but at the same time, I don't have a soft, warm, fuzzy. You know, I, I'm kind of irritated at you most of the time. You know, you, you you always ask the things I don't want. What kind of friend is that? You know, so I don't really have the warm, fuzzy feeling for you, but. I want to love you, but how do I make myself love you when I'm too busy trying to figure out, trying to submit myself to you over and over and over? How do I do that? And the Lord in my own voice spoke to me. It's, uh, God doesn't speak to me frequently in, in voices like that. But in my own mind, he inserted my own words in the back of my mind that said, well, you know, love's not an emotion, right? And it just, it changed there. And it was, it was sarcastic because I'm sarcastic and it, it, it had the, I'm smarter than you kind of mindset their voice. Cause that's how I speak. Uh, but it just penetrated to the marrow. I know what love is. I know it's not an emotion, but when I was walking and thinking about how to love God, I was thinking in terms of the emotion. But once I found out, Hey, this is a commitment this is something that I do. It's an act of the will. This is something I can decide on. That revolutionized my walk with God because I can do this. I can choose to serve him, to love him. And how do I love him? The scripture lets me know how I can choose to love him. To choose to do what somebody else needs to meet the needs of somebody else. I, I don't know if this is parsing. I, I'm really preoccupied with the fact that my computer's about to, to die on me. Um, but um, the, the whole point that I'm going through here 
is that the Lord made it clear to me that one, I've got a choice to love him. It's not something, I'm not going to go to hell because I couldn't conjure up the, an emotion. But I could be saved because he gave me a choice to serve him, to submit myself to him every time. And then how do I do that? How do I love? By, serve, by meeting the needs of my neighbors, by being the good Samaritan to those who are in loss. And so when I read this about, uh, the, about him giving alms, it, it, it touches my soul because it reminds me, I have an easy way of serving the Lord. I've got a way that doesn't just benefit me in my walk with God, but I can be a benefit to other people physically as well as spiritually, financially as well as spiritually. It's not enough just to preach the love of God, but I can make a difference in somebody's life by loving God indeed. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I was, I was loving that as I was going through. If we look in Isaiah 58, um, he said in verse 5, is, is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day unto the Lord? The answer is, you shouldn't be. It's, it's clear in the, term, in, the, in the text, right? In the, in, the, in the tone of the text. You can't call this acceptable. You can't call this, a, this isn't what God wants. And, and he continues on, uh, is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of the wickedness of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free? That's the that's the fast that he had chosen, and that ye break every yoke. Not just he breaks the yokes upon you. You break the yokes that you put upon other people. That's the fast that he has chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke that you've put upon someone else. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. That's the fast he's chosen. That's what's important to God. That's where we see the heart and the mindset of God. What he wants is for us to love our neighbor as ourself. And Cornelius did that. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength by giving alms much to the poor. And Isaiah continues on, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. What's he saying here? If you do the fast I have chosen, then you're going to prosper. Light shall break forth in the morning, your health shall spring forth speedily, but thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. We read that this is, in fact, true because, seriously, I'm going to I'm gonna have to wrap up here. Um, it's, we see that this is true because the angel comes down and says to him, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. It's not enough to love God. But because he feared God with all his heart, with, because he poured himself into his walk with God, and because he demonstrated by understanding the heart and the mindset of God, it was a memorial for, for the Lord. And his righteousness went for him. And he was able, and he, I believe right now, he is waiting the, for the reward, the glory of the Lord, because he died saved. I'm going to move over to this other camera. I'm sorry, I've got a little technology in my in my power cable just died on me. Uh, my wife just got shotgun to fix it, which is part of why I wasn't concentrating. So anyway, uh, the, the point of this all is that Cornelius heard from God. 
God sent an angel directly to him and gave him explicit directions. Uh, we, we see here that the memorial before the Lord of him serving God or fearing God and giving alms to the poor was what Isaiah was talking about. And his righteousness had gone before him and the glory of the Lord shall be his real reward. See, Cornelius was saved because he feared God. He evolved to him. And when God sent him instruction to find out what more to do, he obeyed and followed the Lord. Because he went to see Peter, we'll read later on, he receives the Holy Ghost, he is baptized in Jesus' name, and I believe right now he is in paradise. Awaiting the glory of the Lord. That you and I, when we get to heaven as the body of Christ, he will be one of those voices sitting on the throne alongside us saying, praise our God. He is the forerunner, if you will, of the uh, conversion uh, of the Gentiles, of the gospel being opened to the Gentiles. God is good. I hope you got something out of this uh, travesty of a, of a Zoom meeting. The point is that Cornelius was the beginning and the opening of the uh, gospel to the Gentiles. Because Cornelius feared God, gave alms to the poor, and because he obeyed God when God gave him the full revelation of who he was, you, uh, the gospel was opened up to the poor. The Holy Ghost was poured out upon the Gentiles as well as to the Jews and the Samaritans. And we reap that reward today. And we will reap that re-reward everlasting. So to, to wrap up this, this thing, uh, before I go slinking off into a corner somewhere to break my iPad, uh, let's be like Cornelius. Let's fear God. Let's make him the Lord of our lives. Let's make sure that he is our driving force, that we live for him. Let's not just love him in word, but in deed also by uh, loving our neighbors, by being like the Good Samaritan, by taking care of those who have needs around us. Uh, as we act out in that love, let's, let us also be like Cornelius in that when God tells us more about him, let's jump on that further knowledge. When we find out that there's something else that we can do to love God more completely, to know him more completely, let's jump on that. God is always calling us to come closer to him. And so let's keep that mindset within us that we are never too close to God. We are never close enough to God, that we should always be trying to get closer and closer to him. The more we seek him, the more he will be found of us. The more we draw closer to him, the closer he will draw to us. He will reward our service to him by being, uh, by revealing himself more and more to us, by opening our understanding of him more. And, and then the final reward, of course, is to be with him forever. Amen. So that'll be tonight's message. Again, I'm sorry for the technical stuff, uh, but let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for your word. I hope that people actually heard some of it. And we ask that you open our, our hearts and help us to serve you in spirit and in truth, in word and in deed. That you would uh, urge us and in, in alight that, that desire within us to know more about you and to have a closer walk with you. Draw us closer to you, we pray, Lord Jesus, and help us to be pleasing to you. We want to do your work in your kingdom. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.